Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. Today we're gonna to be exploring the Omniverse. Where do we come from? Well, today we have a special guest who wrote a great book I highly recommend. David Bertolacci is a professional geologist. He studied geology with emphasis on crystallography and geochemistry in 1992 and earned a master's degree in environmental science. But he has also gained knowledge of the universe for nearly two decades by studying astronomy, physics, material science, and spiritual concepts. Today, he's going to be talking about the scientific proposal that he made of the Grand Slam Theory of the Omniverse. Once again, David Bertolacci, welcome to The Circle, David. Thank you. This is a really cool book. I like it a lot. Actually, I want to leave it here if it doesn't block us too much, just in case you don't see it or forget the name. So, before I get to what is the Omniverse, I want to find out, how did you even get involved in this? It started, uh, I'd say, mid-90s, watching a science documentary on, on TV. Um, the physicist Michio Kaku was on, on the show. And uh, his explanation was that one day somebody would come up with an equation one inch long that would be able to describe everything in the universe. And that really just one got inch me long? thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just a tiny <laughs> equation. Sort of like Einstein's E equals MC squared, but more um, all-encompassing to, to describe everything in the universe. So that, that was really the spark. I got you that, motivated that got me to do thinking this. about that. Wow. And so how did you start on this venture? The beginning of it was mainly like a, a series of thoughts, maybe thought experiments, um, just trying to, to put my own consciousness out there to connect and, and really see like what, what the universe is, what the real beginning is, because I, I understood that the Big Bang Theory has a very good description starting at time zero to right now, but it's an incomplete theory. And I had that question in my mind, what happened before the Big Bang happened? Because according to that theory, everything in the universe is basically a singularity, just a single point particle. And this point particle was unstable, and that's why the Big Bang happened. But in my mind, that didn't make sense. If, if it was unstable, then how was it there in the first place? So I found that there had to be some conditions first that, uh, that were able to keep it stable, and then those conditions changed. And when those conditions changed, that's when the Big Bang happened. So you actually think it might have been stable prior, and then it became destabilized, and then bang. Mm -hmm. hmm. And that's where I, uh, I use the um, analogy to compare it to a baseball. That singularity that the universe is just a baseball, and then I realize there's more to the universe than just that. There's the whole ballpark, all of the parking lots around there, and everything else. So when that baseball is inside the baseball field, that's where it's stable. And in order for the Big Bang to happen, it had to be hit right out. This is starting so. to sound like your theory of the Omniverse. Mm -hmm. So let's get to it. <laughs> what <laughs> is this Omniverse? The Omniverse is really, it's, it's the big picture. It's an all-encompassing view of the universe. It, it incorporates the singularity that our Big Bang is, but also... Um, the only way I knew how to describe it in the beginning was the source object. Um, so the source object is really, um, as I've researched it, it's a white hole, which is the opposite of a black hole. Instead of a black hole is a singularity that has immense gravity that sucks everything in, um, not even light can escape it. But the white hole is a theoretical super partner to a black hole in which it, it, it pushes everything out. So if this singularity came from a white hole and was pushed outward, then that's the, the path of travel that it took. Um, what I'm saying is when you're hitting the baseball out of the park. So once it reaches the event horizon, which in this case is the point in which nothing can ever return, that's when all of a sudden the conditions change. Now that particle is unstable and the Big Bang can initiate and everything in our universe comes to be what it is. Our laws of physics start, time starts, and everything we know starts. This show is one of these, what I call, hurt my head shows. So I gotta go back <laughs> a little bit to try to get a grasp on this. So we got the white hole, and that white hole doesn't allow anything in. It's actually spitting everything out. Mm -hmm. 
so did uh, let me see if I get this right. So the baseball, the singularity point, um, did it become a white hole or was it just spitting things out? I think it's being spit out from the white hole. From the white hole. Mm hmm Okay. Interesting. So while it's on the inside, it's it's a stable particle. While it's on the outside, it's unstable and becomes gotcha. the Big Bang. Gotcha. So the Omniverse really, as you mentioned earlier, analogy is, is the ballpark. It's the parking lots? Mm hmm The ballpark, the surrounding area, basically everything. So there are multiple baseballs of us? Well, um, there could be. Okay. Now... It, Here's another question. So we have the ballpark and we have the parking lots. That's the Omniverse, per se? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is there one, do you think, or is there several of these with other baseballs in them? Or? I would think that there's actually the possibility of, of there being several. So there could be but, Minute Maid Park and San Francisco mm -hmm. Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my book basically focuses on one. Um, comparing it to, like, a reaction, just, just a single particle being produced from a single source object and that producing a single Big Bang. But the interesting part is, with the quantum physics in our universe, that single Big Bang produces multiple parallel universes. So, Yeah, that's where I was heading. <laughs> the the uh, options are, are really infinite as far as what can be produced from something like this. It's going to infinitely hurt my head. Um, <laughs> now, the Higgs boson, that was a big discovery they just made a, a recently, or not a discovery, but a confirmation possibly of its existence because of some shadow I think they saw. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, is the Higgs boson work at all in your theory? Mm -hmm. It really. Uh, Actually, can you um, tell me a favor? Tell me what is the Higgs boson, and then we'll go ahead and how it works your theory. The Higgs boson was a, a theoretical particle that actually gave particles mass. It comes into existence for a very, very minute fraction of time, interacts with a particle, um, and determines how that particle interacts with the field surrounding it. And that gives a particle mass. How, how, it, um, how much it interacts with the field determines how much mass it has, like a proton or a neutron has more mass than an electron. So Interesting. that's all determined by how much interaction it has. But uh, what really gave me a clue as to how to compare that to the Omniverse was the fact that it was incorporating a field. The Higgs field is like a magnetic field uh, where there's, there's always a, a power to it or, or a value to it. So, and this is a field that's always on everywhere in the universe. And that's one thing the scientists are still trying to explain is what this field is, where it came from, when it got switched on. And that's one thing that I realized that it related to the Omniverse because I'm describing this in terms of two separate fields. There's one high energy field and uh, that's inside the ballpark. And then there's a lower energy field outside the ballpark where the Big Bang happens. And when I saw the description of the Higgs boson, it, it really looked the same way. They say that at first it's in a high energy field and then it falls to a lower energy state and that's where the particle actually gains its mass. Uh, so it could that's where it could end up being banged I guess or exploding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in the case of the Omniverse um, a particle can interact with this field and the particle can gain space with a with a Higgs field a subatomic particle can interact with that and that particle could gain mass. Interesting. Actually, it's a great analogy. It keeps me in the game with this mm -hmm. interview. <laughs> if not, I'd be way out of the ballpark. <laughs> um, dark energy. How does that play into your theory? Dark energy is the, uh, the expansion of the universe. It was recently found in the 1990s that the expansion is actually an infinite force. Our universe expands exponentially. So as it expands further and further, the objects further away from us expand away from us at a faster rate as time goes on. It has a name, doesn't it? It's called um, is it the theory of inflation? or um, that, You remember the name of that? Um, cosmological constant. Cosmological it's, constant. It's, uh, it's one of Einstein's theories. Well, not theory. He, he used it. It's a, a number that he used to plug into equations to explain why the universe... He was trying to use it to explain why the universe was static, not, not moving. 
but it was later discovered that it's expanding and he abandoned that but it's right now the cosmologists are using that and reviving that in order to explain how this expansion actually works it was once thought that the universe would expand um the expansion would slow down and then the universe would start contracting again and go back into itself um that was called a big crunch but in the 1990s they found out that that's actually not possible because the universe continues to expand but what i found was that it actually fits the description of the omniverse if this if the big bang is occurring on the event horizon of of a surface of the white hole the big bang itself is like a holographic projection from that surface and as the expansion occurs on the curved surface, the projection appears to expand faster and faster and faster. So it really relates to ancient knowledge now going back to the principle of Maya, mm. the illusion, because now we're seeing that the universe might not be what we think it is. It, it could just be a holographic projection. Oh, the hologram theory. Mm -hmm. And this the nature of how the dark energy expands creates a lensing effect and that's what we're viewing is now, that lens does that work with your omniverse concept mm -hmm. all that still fits in where does the the dark energy where is that in the ballpark is that uh is that, is that in the ballpark in the parking lot is that outside is i think that, that would be the outside part the outside part once it once the ball is hit outside and then it would gain momentum and that, that could be the dark energy is just increasing momentum in, in a different uh, direction, so to speak. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Um, have you ever considered uh, or did you even explore the possibility of intelligent design starting the singularity? Or did you, or did you just keep it with, within science? I've heard of intelligent design, but the problem that I have with intelligent design is... Uh, it's something that's filling in the gaps of what we don't know by creating something external to our own consciousness, I think. So I think there is most likely an intelligence, but having that intelligence being something external is hard for me to describe. So, But the omniverse is not, um, it's not an intelligent design type of theory, but it, it's more just about the design. The design itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what else can you tell us about the Omniverse? Anything else uh, that uh, really stood out for you during your studies? I mean, I think one of the comments, uh, we are the afterlife of stars? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Um, that's actually something I ran into. And I, th I think Carl Sagan did a lot of work on, on this back in the 70s. But as as the universe grows, there are, what I realize is there are, everything is part of a life cycle. There are galaxies and stars and everything lives and dies. And when early stars are formed, they start to uh, fuse elements in the early universe. So a star basically is a huge fusion reactor and it can take hydrogen and turn them into helium by combining the atoms and getting a lot of power out of that process. Usually after a couple of generations, you start getting heavier atoms like carbon and even iron. But one, one star will create certain atoms, and then it goes supernova and blows up and spreads those atoms out back into gas clouds. Those gas clouds come back together to form another star eventually, and when that star starts reacting, it starts turning the elements to heavier ones. And that's, that's really the precursor to biological life. That's how all of the atoms in our bodies were actually made, is through living and dying stars. Fascinating, fascinating. And our last question here for the last minute or two that we have left. Um, do you expect us to find life in Mars and does it matter? Um, actually, I do expect to find some sort of life. We have uh, already found some biomolecular signs that there could be uh, building blocks of life. We've had um, several signs of water. And uh, some of the recent pictures I, I saw from, I think it was from Curiosity, they actually found some sedimentary rock on the side oh, of, really? of some uh, some of the hills. So there there was there was water on the planet and there was an atmosphere. So the chances are very high that there was 
some type of life there. Right, and you would know, that's for sure. As a geologist, you would definitely know. Before mm -hmm. we wrap up, I wanted to just make sure we let people see this. What is this again? Um, this is basically the diagram that I came up with that shows the process of, uh, My of the universe way? becoming the Big Bang. Um, it doesn't doesn't matter, I think. Okay. And what is this part here? This this would be the, the source, which is like a white hole. And what it's doing is it's repelling the uh, singularity, which is a point particle. And this line, this curved surface, is uh, the event horizon. And once this particle reaches that, then it becomes the Big Bang. And the other arrows represent the direction of expansion along that curved surface. And that represents dark energy and how we see the universe through that lens. Amazing stuff, David. Thank you so much again for being on The Circle. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank Once you again, me. the book, Omniverse, right here, David Bertolacci. I highly recommend it to get it. Hello, my name's Matt, and I'm an addict. My mom was addicted to prescription pills when I was very young, before I even turned one. Are you or someone you know struggling with alcohol or drug addiction? Has everyone given up on you or your loved one? The caring staff at Elite Care understands and treats you as a whole person. We offer individual and group therapy, holistic healing such as yoga, nutrition and spirituality, medication management, and PTSD treatment. By building upon your strengths and rebuilding broken bonds, we help you begin a successful life. With our staff of licensed psychotherapists and doctors, you can be assured of the highest level of care. Elite Care is the best option for long-term rehabilitation from drugs and alcohol. Contact 888-511-0607 for more information. So let's get into this. Consciousness. I'm trying to figure out how to even start this conversation. But you have a theory, which almost is a definition for you, of consciousness. Can you explain that to us a little bit? Um, what it came to me as part of part of a process after uh, going and writing about how the universe began, what I realized was that the universe itself appears to be something that could actually be alive. When you look at, at the different structures of the universe, stars have their own life cycles. They, they live, they die, they create biological life. Black holes have their own life cycles and control the fate of galaxies. And the universe as a whole seems to have its own life cycle. And what I realized was if this is alive, if it's a living thing, then it could actually be a conscious entity just like us. And since then, what I've found is that our consciousness and this universal consciousness are really one and the same. It's a connection that we have to the universe. And one, one other way I've heard it described is that the universe itself is a broadcast, like a TV station broadcast. And what we are is an antenna. Each of us picks up our own unique channel. And that in itself gives us free will, the, the idea of our own personal consciousness, and also the idea of a connectedness to the universal consciousness. Very fascinating. So you're saying we're almost like a T we're like a TV set. Nothing's happening till we get plugged in mm -hmm. <laughs> to this universe. Interesting. So now you mentioned a word here that I always like to explore, which is free will, and I know we have some people coming in the future to, to discuss free will. And, and in your theory, do we really have free will or is there determinism there? Free will is uh, is a subset of our consciousness. I believe we do have it. One thing that I've found in going further and further into studying our own consciousness is uh, a life purpose. Many, many people speak of, of life purpose and predestined, um, a predestined path. So if, if you really believe that everything is predestined, then free will could actually be irrelevant. But one other Part of what I've heard is that it's like being pre-approved for a credit card. So you're pre-approved for a certain path. Your free will determines 
whether you could follow that path or not. So free oh, will do. free will is is something that's real and it helps us make our decisions in our life to to carry out what we think we're supposed to do. It's a great analogy. I've never heard that before. That's fascinating. Um so the consciousness develops. Yeah, have you explored any factors such as maybe uh, the evolutionary process? Is that do we evolve with this consciousness, or do we always have it? Now we just become more aware. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to think of how do I get my head around this? So we have a TV. It's plugged in, but this TV is old-fashioned TV. It's the one with the little rabbit ears antenna. Mm-hmm. Do we evolve into having the ones with optic fiber capability? Mm-hmm. It was always there, but we just weren't conscious enough to be able to get there. I think consciousness itself is an evolution. There's mm-hmm. always a connection. Even things that that humans don't necessarily perceive as being conscious beings. Um, like, take for example, a dung beetle. But the dung beetle is actually able to navigate where it goes by using the stars. And it does this without having a complex brain. Like the Magi? With the Star of Bethlehem? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> dumb, interesting. So, so it actually uses the stars. So there is some sort of level of consciousness that can be built in. And mm-hmm. as we're growing more complex biologically, we're becoming more aware of this process. And I think that's actually the next step of human evolution, is the next step of awareness of what our consciousness is. Wow, interesting. Now, for the last few minutes here, let's go away from, from humans. Because I know you had some interesting theory about angels. Mm-hmm. Some non-human being here. Some of the uh, other authors that I've been following talk a lot about angels and getting signs from angels. Basically, they're going to give you guidance on following that path that I'm saying that you're pre-approved for. Like whatever path this is, this it could be viewed as your divine purpose. And one thing that I found out in looking at the realm of consciousness is that these can actually be part of our own consciousness. This is part of what it means to become awake and to become aware of our own consciousness. Our consciousness is more than than just what we see as the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, which ironically the subconscious mind controls over 95% of our daily activities. Sure but then if, if we look beyond that, then we see a consciousness of nature and you can... Uh, I, I think they were looking into this with the Gaia hypothesis many, many years ago. Um, and that was the theory that Earth itself is a living conscious being. And nature consciousness is, is one level. Our consciousness is one level. And then on a higher level, you have angel consciousness. And what I'm finding is also the laws of physics are part of our own consciousness. And that's what we use as a subset of instructions on how we actually create our reality through our very perception. So let's let, um, let me just go make sure I, I clarify this. So the angels are actually a, a, a more evolved form of us in mm-hmm. the sense of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does it stop there? Or does it continue on? It continues on. Okay. So the angels um, are one level. It's a very positive, very very high level of consciousness and then as I was saying the laws of physics would be another level of consciousness and that is a level so ingrained into us it molds the reality of our universe and then above that you actually have the the entire universal consciousness and basically it all comes together as one so I I think it's the human condition that what I'm doing is I'm splitting it up into different things that I can categorize and say, well, this, this is this part and this is this part. But it's, it's really just our own perception of how we view one consciousness. Now, the angels are, are not really necessarily a religious aspect. They're just how you're defining a higher conscious level. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not like Angel Gabriel or anything like that from the Bible. Well, they actually do have identity, just, just like us. Okay. Um, they, there is an Archangel Gabriel, and there are se- several others, and many people, psychic mediums, can get clear messages from them. I've never been able to hear them. <laughs> but <laughs> Me neither. I know people that, that can, and they're actually very trustworthy. So it's very, very interesting to, to study this part of it. And, and for me, bringing that back in and, and realizing that that's part of our own consciousness... I think that was the, the tipping point for me um, in just 
realizing the oneness of it all, that they're not separate beings that has actual wings that flies around or anything <laughs> like that. They're or a little baby with <laughs> wings on them. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you very much for contributing to this consciousness concept that we're trying to figure out and find out whether we're here or not. Do we even have this conversation today? I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. It looks like our video guy, Franz, did tape this, so hopefully we can improve it. Once again, I would highly recommend David Bertolacci's book, Grand Slam Theory of the Omniverse. Covers it where we came from. What happened before the Big Bang? Great question. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, we are there. We'll see you next time, everyone.